another election for you to follow. Johnson's playing it safe in the manifesto. Some people would say, Anna, he's capitulated again. He went from 20 billion pounds of tax cuts to three. What did you make of the manifesto? Yeah, it certainly is this playing it safe kind of uh, kind of manifesto uh, promise to the British electorate. Good morning to you, Manus. Playing it safe, sensible. All these used being uh, these words being used to describe a manifesto, which stands in deliberately in contrast to what they did in 2017. Rem remember, with uh, Theresa May as Prime Minister, she brought forward a, a, um, a manifesto that yes, it was about Brexit, but it was also about a fairly radical social agenda that basically spooked the base, and they didn't want to do that this time around. And so, as a result, they are playing it safer. Uh, there are things in there around tax cuts, but it's not the tax cuts that you're referencing for the higher paid that had previously been promised by Boris Johnson when he was running to lead the party. There's a pledge to not increase various kind of income taxes. They want to put more money into the NHS, into spending on health care. But crucially, of course, they want to get Brexit done. You referenced the box set drama that he was talking about. Uh, he also talks about his oven-ready Brexit deal. He says he wants to get that through Parliament before Christmas, which sounds, uh, which, which sounds uh, challenging and, and busy for everybody in the up to the holiday season he wants to leave by the end of january but the scale of what is being pledged here in terms of the, the taxing and spending plans being described by the independent institute for fiscal studies as modest in contrast with what we saw last week from jeremy corbyn a much more radical program of government anna to the polls uh where are we because uh, th this sort of splendid lead. I, I look at Jordan Rochester's note this morning from Namur. He said, well, where's the bounce in Sterling? This is the critical week of when Labour might inch ahead in the polls, and, and that's the risk that we need to assess. Yes, when you're looking back to 2017, and Jordan makes this point this morning from Namuri, as you say in his note, uh, he's looked at where the Labour surge came from late in the running in 2017, and it was around this week. So he's saying, even though the Conservatives are still polling very strongly, that doesn't mean that uh, everything's over and that the Labour Party won't necessarily come from behind uh, to do much better. Let's not remember the Labour Party didn't win in 2017, but they certainly staged a late recovery. And partly because of the fact that the Conservative Party is leading so very strongly in the polls and we saw that once again reasserted reaffirmed over the weekend uh, because of that that's perhaps why we don't see a more radical plan for government coming through from the conservative parties they're able to do as little to be as modest and to still hope that that takes them over the line so in terms of the numbers the britain uh, britain elects poll tracker puts a 12 percentage points gap between the conservatives in the lead and the labor party in second they're benefiting of course still from the uh, the decision by the brexit party to step away in some conservative seats and also doing better in Scotland, according to one panel-based survey, which is interesting. We've had a seat projection over the weekend as well, Manners, which does try and turn these percentages into seats. That is always a challenge. This one from Data Praxis, they say uh, that the latest polling suggests a 48-seat lead for the Conservative Party. But as we've just discussed, things can change. We're into the final few weeks before the election, uh, but things can change. And we watch to see whether we do get any kind of bounce in Stirling based around a Conservative uh, majority.